Star Trek Picard has finally arrived on our screens. Episode 1, titled Remembrance, launched this morning on CBS All Access. Today, we'll review and break down this brand new entry into the Star Trek universe. Engage. Hey everyone, my name is Captain Jack and welcome to Trek Central. As a warning, this video will contain spoilers for Star Trek Picard Episode 1, Season 1. You have been warned. Now Episode 1 is a bold new step into the Star Trek universe. Sir Patrick Stewart has officially reprised his role as Jean-Luc Picard to explore the next chapter of his character's life. Today we'll be reviewing and breaking down Episode 1 and telling you all the details. Warp speed. Ok, before I do jump into this review and breakdown of Episode 1, I'd like to share a few words based on my experience with this episode. Myself and a few members of the Trek Central team first watched this episode about a week ago at the London premiere of Star Trek Picard with Amazon Prime Video and wow. For me, I say this episode launches us gracefully, elegantly and beautifully into a new era of Star Trek. Sir Patrick Stewart does a great job of instantly reactivating the character of Jean-Luc Picard, 18 years after we last saw him on our screens in Star Trek Nemesis. The looks, sounds and tone of the show all feel Star Trek to me. Little details really go far in confirming and cementing that we're in a new era of Star Trek. I'm super excited to go forth and explore this even more, so let's make it so. If you're new to the Trek Central channel and are looking for quality Star Trek content, then I'll ask that you subscribe to stay up to date with all things Star Trek. We'll be reviewing every episode of Picard, breaking it down, and also telling you about the details you missed. Stay tuned. Episode 1 starts with the beauty of space. I don't think I've ever seen space as awe-inspiring as this and with blue skies playing in the background, it really is amazing. It's also kind of cool that this is the very last thing we heard chronologically in Trek is blue skies being hummed by B4 at the end of Nemesis. It ties Picard very well into what came before it, straight out of the gate. We then get to see this amazing HD version of the USS Enterprise D. For those who might not know, this is one of Jean-Luc Picard's starships. He commanded this starship for a considerable amount of time before its destruction. Overall, the model does look rather glossy, but it is great to see a Galaxy-class starship on our screens in 2020. We get a nice scene of Picard and Data playing cards. Data in his post for Next Generation uniform while Picard is in civilian attire. Now Picard is still in the card game, not wanting the actual game to end. The space before them changes to Mars, and as Picard begins to question this, everything begins to shake as explosions start occurring on the planet. Mars explodes and the dream sequence ends. Following the dream's ending, Picard awakens and we move on to see the secondary main character, Daj. She's located on Earth in Greater Boston with her boyfriend, celebrating the fact that she got admitted to the Daystrom Institute. It is pretty cool seeing just everyday normal life on Earth and also a very nice nod to the Daystrom Institute, which has been mentioned numerous times through most Star Trek series, going back to the main man himself, Richard Daystrom in the original series. We'll explore more about this organisation and building later on, so stay tuned. Now the intimate scene is cut ashore and masked intruders beam into their apartment. Daj's boyfriend gets stabbed instantly by a knife, uh oh, and these men proceed to put some sort of device onto her face. Maybe to monitor? Honestly the scene was rather confusing. The masked intruders try to bag Daj, but she activates, whatever that means, and takes them out all pretty easily. As she goes over and finds her boyfriend dead, she sees a picture of Jean-Luc Picard in her mind. Whether this is a flashback or a triggered memory is unclear as of yet. Ok, let's talk about the title sequence of the show, this is always very important for Star Trek and we need to highlight it. Now the big question, what is the title sequence like? The whole image of a glass shard falling through vineyards and Borg cubes is breathtaking, eventually forming up to Picard himself. The music is very calming and a very interesting take on a Star Trek theme. In modern years we have gotten very unique and diverse themes, Enterprise is pretty radical, Star Trek Discovery is pretty unique, so there was a lot of pressure on Star Trek Picard to get it right. Well, I can say, speaking about the music for a moment, it's very solemn and calm, almost as if it's representing Jean-Luc in his later life. No longer are we having the next generation fanfare as we gallivant around space, is it's now in the next calm chapter of this man's life. I have a feeling the shards coming together will reflect what will happen in this series and how it is Picard who brings them all together in some sort of way. Cutting back into present day, Picard then walks down to the vineyard. The music and cinematography in this is just beautiful and is really well shot, and the music just adds to the nice scene in life. Following Picard entering his house, we then finally meet Laris and Zabahan. They're the caretakers of the retired Admiral Picard. 
What is super cool is if you've been reading the Stargate Picard countdown comics, you'll know where these two come from and the amount of connective tissue there is surrounding them. While entering his house, a news program is running which says that the Alpha and Beta Quadrants are in commemoration of the destruction of Romulus, an interplanetary mourning for all citizens. This is quite important and it's about the pivotal event which is the destruction of Romulus. Moving forward we'll obviously learn more about that. But it's pretty cool off the bat we're already you know, recognising that event and the importance it has for the story of Picard. Moving forward we go to an interview with the Federation News Network. This is an organisation which has appeared throughout Star Trek before, even recently in the short trek Children of Mars. Fun little detail you may have missed, one of the interview staff is from the Trill species. Now the interview starts, but before that, Zabahan and Laris remind Jean-Luc Picard to be the captain that the people remember him as. It's very clear that in later life, Picard is secluded from public appearance and may have forgotten who he once was. But luckily these two Romulan friends of his remind him they have not forgotten, and that humanity is not forgotten as a whole. So essentially he has to be the person he once was. Now the interview starts with Picard's past playing with screens of him, you know, as captain of the Enterprise-D, him to of Worf and commemorating his negotiating and diplomatic abilities. The interviewer makes it clear that Picard left the Federation flagship, the USS Enterprise-E, to command the rescue armada on a mission to relocate 900 million Romulan citizens to worlds outside the blast zone of the supernova. Now this supernova would wipe out their planet and many other colonies. Federation Utopia Planitia Shipyards above Mars was constructing 10,000 warp capable ferry starships to deal with this. In the IDW prequel comic we spoke about previously, Starship Picard Countdown, we learned that the mission started in the year 2381, and that Picard was promoted to Admiral and given command of the USS Verity, an Odyssey class starship. The Armada was under construction under the guide of Commander Geordie LaForge and was eventually going to be finished by the year of 2386. Take note, Picard does take place in 2399. Now, a group of rogue synthetics dropped the planetary defence shield and hacked Mars' own defence snare, wiping out the rescue armada and completely destroying Utopia Planitia shipyards. The explosions from the ignited flammable vapours in the stratosphere of Mars has left the planet burning to this day in 2399. It's a pretty pivotal event. This disastrous attack killed 92,000 people and led to the Federation imposing a ban on synthetics and their research. Not only this, but it's implied that Starfleet decided to call off the rescue of the Romulan species. They have essentially left the Romulan people to die, and Picard decided to resign in protest of this. I feel like this is a really good reason for him to resign, the destruction of Romulus killed hundreds of millions of people, and coupled with a ban on androids, of which Data was a good friend of Picard, must have really hurt him. It's even gotten to the point that the interviewer questioned Picard's faith in Data, because he mainly was an android and a synthetic. The interview ends with Picard stating that he ultimately lost faith in Starfleet because it no longer represented what it once was, and therefore he resigned and walked away. Cutting forward, we see Picard sitting in his garden on Chateau Picard, drinking some of his wine and thinking about the interview which has just taken place. Number one, his dog, perks up and runs to Darge who arrives at the homestead. She asks John Luke if he knows who she is, obviously he doesn't, and tries to settle her down when she's in a state of panic due to her whole life being turned upside down. Picard, as always, offers Earl Grey tea, I'm actually drinking this while recording this, and never fails to help. I mean, it is Earl Grey, I mean, come on now. A lot of attention is drawn to Daj's necklace, and we'll find out later why this is of significance. We then get another dream sequence, this time of Data painting a picture in Picard's vineyard. What's an interesting note is that in his previous dream sequence, Picard was not wearing his uniform. In this one, Data and him are both wearing the Next Generation era uniforms, seen obviously in Star Trek The Next Generation. The painting Data is working on is yet of an unfinished faced figure looking over a stormy sea. Data asks, would you like to finish this captain, with Picard replying, I don't know how. And the reply being, that is not true sir, as Data offers the brush once more. I find it interesting that a lot of the Data-Picard dialogue is very personal to Jean-Luc, which makes sense since it's a dream. Picard not wanting the game to end and not knowing how to carry on Data's work. We might need the help of Cancer Troy to help us analyse these dreams fully and what meaning they hold. Waking up at his desk in the study, Picard noticed that the finished version of Data's painting is hanging above his desk. A shocking revelation on how this connects. Fast forward and Picard has made his way to the Starfleet Archive, which is actually next door to the Starfleet Museum. We hear a lot about this throughout Star Trek, pretty cool to actually see it in person. Now here Picard meets with Index, who is a holographic program, might be an internal reference to the emergency medical hologram used in Star Trek Voyager. Either way, it's quite fun to see again more connective tissue with other elements of Star Trek. 
I really like the idea of this. Now upon entering his own quantum archive, which is where tons of information and memorabilia is stored, we can see mementos from his past, most notably models of ships he's commanded, such as the USS Stargazer, his first command. Picard enters the archive and draws out a painting that Data originally painted. He asks the index for the name, and the index gives the name as Daughter. This is what Data named it. Now one thing I'm quite confused about following the scene is Daj's mother. Following the attack and Daj leaving Chateau Picard, she calls up her mum as she roams the streets of France. She says she's being hunted down as someone tried to kill her. Now her mum retorts by saying she should find Picard and stay with him, but as Daj notices, and we as viewers notice, she never actually mentions she went to Picard, but somehow her mother knows that. The holographic program of her glitches in some sort of way, almost to suggest she's not actually real. I have an understanding there probably will be more to this later in the future, but for the moment it's pretty unclear. Her mother seems to reactivate Daj in some way, and Daj is able to track down Picard at the Starfleet Museum and make her way there. As they meet up, Picard tells Daj about Data. He speaks about Data in such a sweet way, remembering how his former friend once was. Even saying that Daj is dear to him due to a possible connection with his former friend and shipmate. We get this very interesting moment of Daj remarking that androids are being soulless, murderous robots. Which I think is a very cool way of seeing how the Mars attack has rapidly shifted the Federation populace's view on androids and synthetic lifeforms as a whole. There's definitely been a change of opinion in the entire United Federation of Planets and probably the galaxy as a whole. I have a feeling the attack on Mars shook the Federation to the core. 92,000 dead is a hell of a big number. So yeah, there's definitely going to be more to this as we move throughout the series. Eventually it's revealed that Daj has noticed the attackers have found her again, and her and Picard move to run up to the roof of the building. She drags Picard up the stairwell, and uh, we can clearly see Picard isn't what he used to be, and is struggling to get up a flight of stairs, which are quite long. I mean, probably I would, to be honest, at his age. I think anyone would. It's really cool to see that, you know, this is almost like Sir Patrick in real life, because this is 18 years since he last appeared on screen, and he's aged as well as all of us, so uh, if you were in his position, you'd struggle going up those stairs. Now eventually the attackers beam in, Daj is able to neutralise them with speed and efficiency, but one of them activates something in a tooth, kind of like a cyanide pill in those spy movies, but instead they spit some sort of liquid acid towards Daj. This seriously burns and scars her, causing the stolen rifle she was also holding to explode. The explosion kills Daj in the process and seriously knocks back Picard. This entire fight scene is actually quite good, my only qualm of it is the Superman jump Daj does to get to one of the attackers. It's a bit cliche, but kind of is reminiscent of how Data and his abilities in First Contact and Nemesis. So yeah, maybe, I don't know, it's rather interesting to see. Eventually Jean-Luc wakes up in his home under the care of Lars and Zabraham, and we learn that Daj could have an automated cloaking device which makes it invisible to CCTV cameras. If you listen closely to the scene, Zabraham says that a police found Picard alone on the building rooftop, and there was no record of Daj or the Romulan agents being there. Yes, we did learn that these agents were actually Romulans, judging by one of their helmets breaking. I do have to say, it's kind of weird to find out that there's no record of these here. Either these mysterious attackers are covering up where they're going around, or someone else is covering up, or maybe they actually do have personal cloaking devices. But surely you'd see the weapons scoring and explosions around the place. In his mild anger, Picard says he's let Daj down who came to him for safety. This might be one of the few times we see Jean-Luc drop his personal guard and gruff shield to let his raw emotions flow out. His mini-speech about wanting to die rings home about the current stage of his life. It's painfully obvious that he misses the adventures he used to have while part of Starfleet. Moving forward, Picard visits the actual Daystrom Institute in Okinawa. I think this is the first time we actually see a Daystrom Institute facility, even though it gets mentioned numerous times throughout Star Trek. There was actually never a location given for this organisation, I was researching this a couple of days ago, but isn't one noted down, so I guess neither is. We then meet Dr. Agnes Girati, played by Alison Pill. She's amazing, she immediately laughs at Picard's request on whether you can make an android out of flesh and blood. We learn that rogue simps that attacked Mars came from that very lab, and because of that, the ban of cybernetic research, they are only allowed to operate theoretically, much to the dismay of Dr. Girati and Picard. They can't actually build an actual android or synthetic, so half their department is now closed down as like a ghost town. Moving forward, we get more connected tissue with previous Star Trek to come before it, in the fact we find B4, the prototype android to Data, in a drawer stored in this laboratory. We do get a mention of one of my favourite characters from Star Trek The Next Generation, Bruce Maddox, the commander who tried to disassemble Data to create an army of androids. He was unsuccessful in one of the greatest episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Measure of a Man, go watch it if you haven't, however he did eventually work on more androids and synthetic lifeforms. Unfortunately, Maddox went missing after a ban on synthetic lifeforms, with Girati informing Picard that no one has seen him ever since. 
I do have to speculate and wonder if finding Maddox will be a part of Picard's plan, but more on that another time. It's alluded that the rogue synthetics must have not been as advanced as Data however, as it said no one since Data's creator, Dr. Noonien Sung, has been able to make an android like him, and to make one would require the components of Data. So the fact that rogue synths are not as advanced as Data makes me think that some third party used them to attack the shipyards. Tang Shiar maybe? Hmm. Eventually it's revealed that through Daesh's necklace, which Picard still has, it's a symbol of fractal neuronic cloning, a radical, beautiful idea of the former Commander Maddox's, where an android's entire code and memories could be reconstructed from a single positronic neuron. Lots of Star Trek technical babble here, and some of you might understand it, others might not. Either way, it's quite cool to see they're throwing in these words again to kind of bring back that Star Trek cliché. We find out from Dr. Jurati that these androids are actually created as twins, therefore meaning that the now deceased Daj actually has a sister somewhere out there in the galaxy. This revelation stuns Picard as he realises his newfound adventure is far from over. I have to say there is a beautiful v VFX transition between the necklace and what appears to be this shot in space. We see this new type of Romulan vessel, which is obviously some type of warbird, entering the system and goes to the Romulan re reclamation site. This Romulan reclamation site is actually a damaged Borg cube that we've seen in mu multiple of the trailers so far. I believe the Romulans are scrapping this Borg cube not only for technology, but also helping the former Borg on board. It's kind of unclear what they're doing, whether they're scrapping it or rebuilding it, they're certainly up to something. Here we're introduced to Narek, who is played by Harry Treadaway. He comes on screen looking all evil and meets up with Dr. Sojin Asher, who is Daj's twin. I have to say, his entrance to this worksite is very evil and mysterious, he certainly has that bad guy swagger cliche and I love it. Having spoken to Harry Treadaway at the Star Trek Picard premiere in London, and I think his character is going to be awesome, I can't wait to see more of him. Narek speaks to Soji in a very manipulative way and comments on how she spends all day fixing broken people. This line here is very important and makes me think about the Borg we've seen in the trailers and also the reclamation site. It's a broken environment, most likely of broken Borg drones and people. Therefore, Dr. Soji, or Daj Mark II as we're now calling her, has some sort of hand in healing and assisting former Borg drones. This is just a theory so far and we don't know, but hopefully we'll see later on. I do really want to know why this Borg cube is here and what level of importance it has. They're certainly up to something. Again, the Romans are always up to something freaky and weird with Borg technology. We know this in the extended Star Trek universe. So the fact they're bringing it here into the Prime Star Trek universe and the canon is quite interesting. We'll have to learn more about this at a later date, but typically when it comes to Borg, things usually aren't good and the galaxy usually shoots first and asks questions later. Then again, we know from experience that Romans are a weird group and most likely up to something. And there we have it, episode 1 of Star Trek Picard ends there. Alright, let's share some of our thoughts on this episode overall and the series so far. This was probably one of the strongest first episodes of a Star Trek series. It feels extremely cinematic in all that it does, and I can probably say this is more like a 10 hour movie than a TV series. The music was absolutely stunning in certain scenes, the cinematography of the entire thing was movie quality. And the exuberance and energy Sir Patrick Stewart brings to the character is amazing. You can really feel every single emotion that Picard is feeling, which is very important for this story as it's very grounded. All the secondary characters are also amazing, I absolutely adore Zolaris and Zabahan, and it's great to see these characters who we first met in a comic series. The connective tissue binding the show to what has come before in the legacy of the Star Trek franchise is fantastic. As earlier mentioned, the little details personally win me over. For me, this is a perfect evolution of technology that also modernises Star Trek at the same time. Taking something that has existed before in Star Trek, like the screens, and gently updating them, but naturally as they would in this universe. Now if I had to pick one issue with the design of Star Trek Picard, then I'd have to say it's the reuse of the Star Trek Discovery shuttle pods. Why this has been decided, I do not know. This isn't a massive issue and is certainly not going to make me stop watching this new show or series, but it's one of those things I think could have been changed to better suit the era of Star Trek we're in. Again, it's not a big deal and who knows. There might be an explanation for this sometime later, so I'll wait and see. At the end of the day, it's a cool design, but it is almost 200 to 300 years old now. Hmm. I'd say Daj's introduction and then eventual death was extremely fast paced. We have this girl who's enjoying a nice romantic evening with a boyfriend, and then she's instantly taken out of that. She finally finds Picard on his vineyard, and then instantly leaves the next morning. She finds Picard again, and then instantly dies. We do get some really nice moments with Daj, which just highlight how fast her character moves about this episode. I understand what the writers were trying to do here, and for the most part it works, but it still feels very fast paced. Then again, with the series being grounded in focus and much more character driven, Daj's fast paced adventures could be there to shape things up, 
Either way, it works. At the end of episode 1, there was a nice mini trailer for the story of Starship Picard season 1. Though we'll be discussing that in another trailer as it contains a lot of details which will take some time. Alright, that wraps up Trek Central's review of Starship Picard episode 1. Brand new episodes come out every week on Thursdays via CBS All Access and Fridays via Amazon Prime Video. Tune in weekly to Trek Central on Friday evenings for brand new live streams talking about the latest episodes with special guests. If you like this video and want to keep up to date with all things Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to subscribe to Trek Central here on YouTube. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates, as well as visit our website for weekly articles. We're also now rolling out our community Discord server, so come and join the party ahead of a new series. For now, I've been Captain Jack, thank you for watching Trek Central, and I hope you enjoy the new series, and I'll of course see you sometime soon. Goodbye.